situation. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, congratulations to the team of Hormone India. It's lovely to see such young dynamic endocrinologists taking the lead in academics ahead. So the topic in the next 20 minutes or so I'll talk of is the etiological diagnosis of thyrotoxicosis. I think up front, it's very, very important for us to realize that first and foremost, we have to remember not all thyrotoxicosis is hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is only when the thyrotoxicosis has been caused by an inappropriately high synthesis and secretion from the thyroid gland per se of thyroid hormones. Of course, there can be extra thyroidal origin of thyroid hormones. We'll talk of in a few cases. But thyrotoxicosis as an entity is a clinical condition that results from excess thyroid hormone effect in various tissues. So that excess thyroid hormone can be iatrogenic, can be hyperthyroidism, can be thyrotoxicosis uh, due to thyroiditis as well. Now, these are some of the common causes we will encounter in clinical practice. Thyrotoxicosis with hyperthyroidism most commonly is seen from Graves disease or nodular goiter, which can be toxic, multinodular or solitary toxic adenoma. But then we have the rare cases of TSHOMAs from the pituitary. We could have congenital hyperthyroidism and certain pregnancy-related conditions. I'll uh, stay away from that for this talk. Then uh, even uh, you know high iodine exposure resulting from contrast agents or iodine-containing drugs like amiodarone can result in uh, hyperthyroidism. The extrathyroidal sources of thyroid hormone could be certain ovarian tumors like struma ovari or you know, metastatic follicular cancer. The other entity we must differentiate from hyper is when there is no hyperthyroidism, but there is a feature of thyroiditis, wherein since the thyroid gland uh, stores in a lot of thyroid hormone in the follicles. So if there is any insult on the thyroid, such as an inflammation, infection, or drug-induced thyroiditis, it can cause an outflow of that stored thyroid hormone and lead to a transient phase of thyrotoxicosis. So all forms of thyroiditis would basically come in this category. And then, of course, can be exogenous sources of thyroid hormones, such as patients taking it for therapy, we know that we suppress TSH in patients who have thyroid uh, differentiated thyroid malignancies. And there can be other uh, reasons, accidental overingestion or fictitious thyrotoxicosis because of intentional mm -hmm. intake. Now, the clinical picture could vary from, you know, most patients you would pick on when they come with frank features of thyrotoxicosis, but quite often you would get referrals because of abnormal lab values wherein you are suspecting thyrotoxicosis. Then there could be goiter, nodule, presentation with neck pain, and certain other things like ophthalmopathy or the history of ingestion of medications. Now, it is very important to make the etiological diagnosis because that will determine the course of management. The management for thyroiditis versus hyperthyroidism is going to be entirely different. And between hyperthyroidism categories also, the management of Graves' disease is going to differ from multinodular goiter or from toxic adenoma. So the very first question is, confirm your thyrotoxicosis. Of course, when you get a clear picture of elevated thyroid hormones with suppressed TSH, prima facie, we can assume we are getting confirmed thyrotoxicosis. But you could have these two entities with normal free T3, free T4 and suppressed TSH, which could be either subclinical thyrotoxicosis, but this picture can also occur in non-thyroidal illness or could be caused by certain drugs like steroids, or if a patient has undergone recent treatment for hyperthyroidism, partially treated, again, you could have this clinical picture. The second entity that we might encounter is elevated free hormones, T3 and T4, and the TSH may be normal or elevated. Again, you could have a multitude of reasons for such a kind of presentation. Most commonly, this could result from assay interference. If total T4 and total T3 are high, but free hormones are normal, think of you know, elevated TBG levels, elevated binding proteins. But again, you could get such picture from a patient who is on thyroxine and not very compliant. So just a couple of days before your test, 
usually these patients will tend to take adequate thyroid hormone and you might get this kind of a picture. But having excluded all of these, then you have to think of resistance to thyroid hormone or TSH adenomas uh, from the pituitary. Let's look at a case scenario about what I'm exactly meaning here. So 25-year lady comes with a package report and says she has a thyroid problem. You can see a T4 elevated TSH is low. There are no clinical signs or symptoms. When you take a care history, she has been on supplements taking for the last one month. So what happens is she stops those supplements, comes back after two to three days with another report, and this time the thyroid hormones are actually normal. This is not an uncommon condition to encounter. And what is happening here is she was taking a hair supplement containing high doses of biotin and she was taking two tablets a day. So it has to be remembered that certain substances can interfere with thyroid hormone assays and biotin in particular, because these assays use biotinylated compounds. You could have false low values in uh, sandwich assays for TSH and for T3, T4, even the antibody titers could be false high because of interference with biotin. So these lab abnormalities, we should be able to exclude. The next important thing is, is it hyperthyroidism or not? And mind you, thyrotoxic symptoms may not differentiate thyroiditis from hyperthyroidism. There could be certain clues in clinical picture like stigmata of Graves' disease, of thalmopathy, or presence of nodules or goiter, a past history of thyroid disease or a family history of autoimmune diseases or personal history of autoimmune diseases, which could point to etiology. Look for any recent respiratory infections, neck pain, tenderness, pregnancy and postpartum state, and a detailed medication history of a lot of medications can interfere with thyroid physiology, uh, including thyroxine, iodine, amiodron, lithium. But now we also know certain cancer drugs like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, immune checkpoint inhibitors, they can cause all sorts of thyroid dysfunctions. So the next question, when you look at biochemistry, you can look at T3, T4 ratio. And in patients who have tissue hyperthyroidism, T3 is usually secreted in higher concentration compared to thyroiditis, where T4 levels are higher because that's the more, uh, you know, larger amount of stored hormone. So several experts have suggested looking at T3, T4 ratios, total T3, total T4 ratio of more than 20 could indicate hyperthyroidism. For free T4, the ratio is 4.4. So let's look at two clinic, uh, you know, same patient with two kind of blood pictures, 32 year male coming with thyrotoxic symptoms. In the first picture, you can look at total T3 is high, total T4 is not that high, used to getting a ratio of 29. In the second picture, you're getting a ratio of 15. There possibly the second case is thyroiditis in the first case is hyper. So let's look at a couple of clinical scenarios as we go along investigating. So we have a 35-year lady coming with thyrotoxic symptoms lasting three months. She has diffuse goiter, no nodules, no tenderness. And on the examination, you can clearly see exophthalmos and periorbital edema, conjunctival edema. You look at her profile, uh, it is suggestive of frank thyrotoxicosis. So do we do any further investigations or can we make a confident diagnosis at this stage? So if the clinical picture is suggestive and you get these telltale signs of Graves' disease, you can make a confident diagnosis of Graves' disease and put her on therapy without the need for investigations further, other than, of course, for uh, planning of therapy. So you can see clearly exophthalmos, lid retraction, periorbit, it was anterior neck pain radiating to the right ear. Three weeks back, there is a history of URTI that has improved. And on examination, you get a grade one firm palpable diffuse goiter. Again, you're getting T3, T4, TSH, all showing thyrotoxicosis. T3, T4 ratio is 12.8. What should be the next step? Do we go ahead with avoiding the need for unnecessary investigations? And this picture suggested subacute thyrotoxicosis. We could have managed it as subacute thyroiditis clinically also. But two more cases, 35-year lady, weight loss, tremors and palpitations, three months, there is diffuse goiter, no nodules. You see a hyperthyroid kind of a blood picture on the thyroid profile. What should be the next step in this case? Can we assume Graves' disease or you know nodular goiter, etc.? No. The other cases, a 43-year lady, again, coming with symptoms since one month, diffuse goiter with a left side nodule. There is no brewing. And you're getting a picture of 
hyperthyroidism also. So let's look at how we approach these two cases. So what are the differentiating tests we can perform in such a scenario? We can do a thyroid scintigraphy and uptake that we've been doing, I think, ever since I did my DM. That was the next first approach. Or we could measure a TSH receptor antibody and ultrasound with color flow Doppler. So why thyroid scintigraphy? because it helps differentiate various causes of thyrotoxicosis. So if the uptake is normal or increased, think of Graves' disease, nodular goiter or adenoma. If the uptake is absent, it indicates either tissue thyroiditis or the source of thyroid hormones is elsewhere, like stroma ovari or fictitious. The other thing we look at scintigraphy is the tracer distribution. And it's very uh, discriminating, again, in a way that Graves' disease would have a clear picture of diffuse increased uptake in both the glands. That's Graves' disease. Then you could have a functional adenoma, wherein you get the uptake only in that part of the gland nodule, and the uptake elsewhere is suppressed. Or you could have a classical picture of toxic multinodular goitre. And thyroiditis would have no uptake in thyroid gland, but uptake would be okay, normal in the salivary glands. So in a way, thyroid scintigraphy could be a very useful investigation to differentiate all the various factors. But of course, availability is limited. Cost is a consideration. And if there has been a recent iodine exposure, such as the patient has undergone a recent CT scan with iodinated contrast, it might be unreliable on the thyroid scintigraphy. And even in areas of iodine insufficiency, the uptake might not be very good. However, for times since long, I think thyroid scintigraphy has still been considered the next best investigation in life. But more recently, the role of measuring TSH receptor antibodies has been increasingly understood. And while these assays were difficult to access in the past, I think in the last one decade or so, they are more readily available. And what we are measuring by commonly in you know, uh, clinical labs is the competitive binding assays where we measure thyroid binding immunoglobulins. The bioassays are reserved for research purposes, but even these competitive binding assays have very high sensitivity and specificity for Graves' disease. And if negative or inconclusive, you could think of scintigraphy. In fact, in a recent meta-analysis by the European Thyroid Society, they summarized that using TSH receptor antibody as the next step instead of dictation scintigraphy has shortened the time for diagnosis by 46% and cost by 47%. And in fact, a lot of other countries like uh, Japan and Korea are also recommending TSH receptor antibodies as the next step. But this has to be paired with ultrasound with a color doctor. In fact, ultrasound also can have very good discriminatory value when done by a trained radiologist or endocrinologist. And what you would see in uh, Graves' disease is a diffuse, enlarged, hypoechoic gland with a picture that's very typical called thyroid inferno, increased blood flow throughout the gland. On the other hand, thyroiditis would have a gland which is heterogeneous and there would be decreased blood flow. And of course, nodular gland can easily be picked up. In fact, ultrasound might always be needed in a patient with a nodular goiter for characterizing of those nodules. So let's go back to the two patients we had. So 35-year lady with no other features, just a diffuse goiter. What was done was TSH receptor antibody. It was positive. Ultrasound showed a diffuse goiter with increased vascularity. The diagnosis could be made Graves' disease. The second lady had 43-year lady had thyrotoxicosis, but with, along with diffuse goiter, she also had a left side thyroid nodule. So for her, the next approach was a technetian scintigraphy and uptake. And while it showed a Graves' disease, it also showed a cold nodule. And I think we already heard from Dr. Saptrishi earlier about how to manage cold, uh, you know, approach these suspicious nodules. This should be further characterized by ultrasound and epinacy for further treatment. So this is to summarize where we stand with the next set of investigations. So you could consider radioactive iodine uptake, which will help di differentiate between toxic goiter, uh, versus Graves' disease, versus thyroiditis or other causes, or depending on availability or lack of availability of radioactive iodine, you could consider a thyroid ultrasound with trap. And if you have a, a trap positive diffuse goiter, it's Graves' disease. If you have trap negative nodular goiter, then 
characterization has to be done with both ultrasound and radioactive iodine. So just to summarize, we'll go through a couple of other cases. So this is a 61-year lady with a, you can see a clear multinodular goiter and you're seeing thyrotoxicosis. In this case, I think we need both ultrasound as well as technician centigraphy. Centigraphy will give us the diagnosis as far as the cause of hyperthyroidism, but an ultrasound will also help to plan the next steps, which most likely this patient would be surgical. Another lady comes with 67-year lady anxiety palpitations. When you see the blood picture, she has subclinical thyrotoxicosis. She also has hypertension at 67. She has a nodule 3 centimeters. So then possibility clinically also is AFTN. And when you do the next test, technetium centigraphy, it confirms the toxic adenoma. And it can be easily managed with radioiodine ablation. This was another atypical case from my clinic. She kind of moved us around a bit before we came to the diagnosis. A 36-year lady came with frank thyrotoxic symptoms. She had a history of hypothyroidism diagnosed four years back, was on levothyroxine. Two months back, her referring physician had stopped her thyroxine because she had, you know, the blood reports had started showing thyrotoxicosis. And after one month, he had put her on methimazole because the thyrotoxicosis somehow persisted. She insisted she was taking methimazole regularly. She was taking nothing else. And when you saw her blood trick picture, free T4 and free T3 are markedly high, TSH is suppressed. We did a technetium scan, there was no uptake. We did an ultrasound, which was a very small gland, no nodule, no increased vascularity. We also actually did an ultrasound abdominal pelvis for any ovarian tumors, there was nothing there. So this is a very atypical presentation. And the patient was withholding a lot of information. So the next step in this patient was to measure her serum thyroglobulin levels, which confirmed the small gland of thyroid ultrasound and her thyroglobulin actually was very low. On direct questioning, she then came forth with a history that while she was taking methimazole, she was also taking levothyroxine four tablets a day because she thought it helped with weight reduction. So this was a classic case of fictitious thyrotoxicosis. Uh, another patient, 45-year male, palpitations, anxiety, and hyperdefecation. No medications of past history. There was a mild diffuse thyromegaly. In this patient, you see an elevated T3, T4, and TSH, which is also elevated. Now, in the presence of symptoms, this does indicate that we are dealing with a kind of either central hyperthyroidism or resistance to thyroid hormones. Technetium uptake showed diffuse increased uptake. And these were the three possibilities. Assay interference was ruled out. There was no family history and the alpha subunit was normal. So the next step of him was a TSH, uh, uh, MRI of the uh, pituitary area, which showed a clear TSH of us. Last case, a 66-year male came with paroxysmal AF. He had been on a myodrone already for past six months, and there was no past or family history of thyroid dysfunction. In the last four weeks, he had lost some th uh, three kilos of weight and had some thyrotoxic symptoms and had come with AF despite being on a myodrone. And what was done further was the blood report confirmed thyrotoxicosis, CRP, ASR were normal. Ultrasound showed a slightly hypoechoic gland with absent hypervascularity, and technetium scan was showing absent thyroid uptake. Now, in this case, the diagnosis between type 1 and type 2 thyroiditis was kind of more straightforward. This patient had type 2 destructive thyroiditis, which was induced by a myodron. But mind you, sometimes differentiating between type 1 and type 2 a myodron induced thyrotoxicosis can be difficult. So uh, to quickly wrap up what we've discussed over the last 18, 20 minutes, spurious lab results must be excluded before you start investigating further. And of course, they have to be uh, you know, correlated with the clinical picture. It's very important to differentiate between thyrotoxicosis with or without hyperthyroidism. Etiological diagnosis is extremely important because that will determine the course of management. And for most of the patients, once you've ruled out thyroiditis, the differentiation can be made by using either technetium centigraphy or a TSH receptor antibody and ultrasound with color flow Doppler. But this should be a personalized choice. There is no one single route. It has to be depending on the availability of investigations and the clinical picture of the patient. So I'll conclude here. Thank you.